soul love community presents once again the true light as the prophet has said seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave this program will give you the answers to all your questions from the beginning of time until judgment day the hourglass is almost empty so come and hear the dynamic teachings of the honorable elijah muhammad noble Zhu Ali, marcus garvey clarence 13 and all those who want to send to raise you the lost but now found sheep in the wilderness of north america نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والي الكريم وصلى الله على أنبياء أجمعين والمسيح والمحدي والمجدد لمن مرسلين أما بعد Are we not the bearers of witness that nothing would exist if Allah didn't create it? And that He is alone and has no part? And that all gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sustainer of all the boundless universes. All gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generous eternal friend. And send salutations of Allah on all of His prophets and His apostles and on the Messiah, the anointed one, and on the Mahdi, the God. And on the Mujahidah, the reform, which was all sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send greetings and we send peace throughout the boundless universe to all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And now, the true light featuring a Sayyid Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi. Right? 
What does it say? He was not the father of any of you men, but he was Rasulullah, sent from Allah, that ends that, because Wa is there, and the seal of the Prophet. What verse is that again? That is the 40th verse of the 33rd chapter. It ends that section, right? It's the fifth section. Notice how it's written. Ma'akana, not Ma'akana, was Muhammad, that's who he is, Aba, the father, Ahadin, of anyone, men, from Rijalakum, you men, all you men. Wa, thought, and, lakin, for lakin, but, Rasulullah, he was sent from Allah, for Allah's apostles, not messenger. It's a difference, okay? Wa, and, thought, a new thought. Khatim and Nabi, or Nabiina, which is the seal, Khatim, of the Prophet. It didn't say he was the seal of the Apostle. It said he was the seal of the Prophet. Muslims would like to say that. They teach that, but the Quran doesn't say that. That's why they killed Dr. Ishaq Khalifa, okay. because he was claiming to be that seal of the Prophet. Okay, so is that to say that there could be possible another Apostle, where there could be not another Apostle? I say this. I say it's very possible that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was everything he said he was, especially by his work. Now, I also say that because the hadith that they believe in say that Isa and Miriam will come, and when he was here, he was the Messiah, and he was a Nebi because he received an Indian, and he was an apostle because he had explained the Torah, that if he's going to come as the Sunni Muslim, what is he going to be when he comes? Is he just going to be a man? Or, understand my point, insofar as he was an apostle, when he returns, he's not going to even be an apostle anymore? You understand what I'm saying? Right. If he was an apostle and he left the world and Allah, Rasa'a, took him up to him and he's alive like Muslims say in heaven, Yet to be turned, when he comes back to earth, isn't he still going to be an apostle? If we're going to recognize him as the same Jesus that was here 2,000 years ago, wouldn't he still be an apostle? He won't be a Nebi, because he's not going to bring any more books, because the Quran is the last revelation. He won't be a Nebi, but he will be a mess. What they're doing is they're blowing the meaning of the word apostle out of proportion. That's what they're doing. They're making it greater than it is. They're making it look like a big office. There are many apostles, many of them. Wouldn't John, the son of Zebedee, be an apostle? Yes. He would be a prophet and an apostle, because he also received the book of John. He received the book of Revelation for Jesus from the angels. But he also received the book of John, so he was a prophet also. Uncle Aten, Uncle Aten of ancient Egypt, Nefertiti's husband, was a prophet of Allah. That's why it is writings in ancient Egypt that match so close to the Torah of Moses. Because he taught Tawheed in Egypt. Look it up. See, his name, Unk Atman, is not the same as Unk Ammon. Ammon is equivalent to the Hebrew Elohim, or Alahuma, the plurality of the deification. As they say, using the word they use, deification. Whereas Atman is equivalent to like the Allah, the single. So when they say his name is Unk Atom, or Atom, they're saying he holds the key of life to the one deity. When they say Unk Amon, Amon is a plurality of gods in ancient Egypt. He was a part of those who worshipped more than one god. And, and I jumped to God because I don't want to talk a lot about what I'm wrong. You understand what I'm saying today? So he, the one, when they, just by his name, Unk Atom, Tells you. Now you know that when Abraham got to Egypt, he was dealing with a pharaoh by the name of Abimelech. If you look at the word Abimelech, you see that that's not a hieroglyphic word. It's a Hebrew word. Abimelech. 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 Those Egyptians were Hebrews. Ancient descendants of Noah. From his son Mizraim. To his son's son Mizraim. Look at the Bible, you'll find that those Mizraimites of the Bible are the real Egyptians. That's why Egypt is called Mizraim. That's, that's the number of the Arab 
classic way of saying Mizraim in the Bible. So they were Noah's descendants and believed in Tawheed also. Yes, they will find documents in the book of the dead and Proverbs. And they'll say, this looks like the exact same thing Moses taught. Of course it's the exact same thing Moses taught. The Quran has a story of Mary and Jesus in it. The exact same story of the Sinjil. The Quran has a story of Moses in his revelation. The exact same story of the Torah. So of course the Egyptian books are going to have the exact same story but the same, from the same creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Uncle Atun was a prophet of his. There's many prophets who are not mentioned by name in the Quran, the Quran says. Many of them. Muslims are now and them stupid Saudi Arabians are trying to narrow you down to the Quraysh and then say that's them. Well, everything comes from them. Absorb all the Sahaba, all the Sahaba. Listen to the Sahaba. Listen to the Sahaba. Where in the Quran does Allah tell me and you to listen to the Sahaba? Where? Show me. Anywhere. And if they say, well, um, they didn't mention their names in there. Then you say, you mean tell me Allah never mentioned none of the men's names that helped the Prophet Muhammad, right? But I'm going to a certain section. But he does this. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Right? But he does mention a man called Abi Lahab who opposed the Prophet. You know what I'm saying? But they will mention a negative person. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us in the Quran if he wanted us to, to obey those Sahaba? Why isn't it in there anywhere? Because he didn't want it. That's something they made up because they were trying to suppress the Sudanese family, the real family, Ali, Fatima, Muhammad. You understand? That was a pure seed. And those pale Arabs were trying to stop that, as they've always done. They refused to prostrate to Adam. Since the foundation of the world, Iblis has refused to prostrate to Adam, and to this very day, white Adams do not recognize black scholars. Never. Name a, a black scholar that the white man says is a black scholar. He won't recognize that. Honorable Elijah Muhammad's been teaching for 40 some years, and remember, though he had his own teaching, in that which he taught, he was a but they won't say, well, though we disagree with him, in that which he taught, he was a... But they'll snatch Ahmed Dijak from Durban, Africa. South Africa, because he's old Pakistanian. Now, he said he's black, and I'll accept him. But as far as they're concerned, he's one of them, and he's a scholar. He don't know one, he hasn't taught one fraction of information that I've been teaching you all about the Bible. But Imam Issa is not a scholar. He's a renegade, a nut, a crazy man, a saint, a jinn, I'm all of that stuff. But not a scholar. Honorable Elijah Muhammad, not a scholar. Nancy Lewis Farrakhan, not a scholar. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. See how they work? That's the whole plot. And that's all I'm fighting against. They will not bury Adam C. under some white sand. You ain't going to put the black, put, you know how they do a beat? They take rip and they put dead sand on top of it. Some people go there and lay down there and burn themselves up. They're not going to put no sand on top of this rip soil. We are Adam's descendants. We are the sensula of the Prophet Muhammad, or you people are the Nubians, the Sudanese, the Middle Seas, the Pell Arabs ain't nothing, and they're doing everything they can to keep you from identifying with who you are. That's all it is. Try to turn everything whitewash. Like I said last week, they're trying to take the picture of Martin Luther King. I don't know if you noticed it. They're thinning out his nose, and they're thinning out his lips. I'm serious. Now look at the pictures they draw of him. He's getting whiter and whiter. That's how they do it. They slow on the mature. Next thing you know, you'll be looking at Martin Luther King, he look, and he'll be light skin. <laughs> Three or four generations from now, you forget what he looks like. That's the way they work. No, 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 no. That's why we're here. We are the Nubian family. And we will keep our seed alive. And I'm telling you people, the white man is never going to acknowledge you. Never. He didn't acknowledge you in the beginning when Allah told the angels to prostrate to Adam, right? All of them did except who? He, he refused. The white man, the father, he's Lucifer, the father of the devil. The one who fell from grace, that's him. And believe me, he's going to spread his teachings throughout the world. 
trying to keep me and you thinking. And believe it or not, there's a whole lot of Sudanese, you know, blacker than me. Make me look light skinned. You say, my mama was white, though. <laughs> Some of them say he's red. He was red. I say, you mean like a fire engine? What do you mean by red? Because if you mean red like the average Latino, then he was black. That's, that's what you're saying. Then we, we ain't got no problem. But if you're going to try to make me think that he was white, that's different. If you tell me that he looked, oh, no, the problem is he didn't look like you. He looked like a Puerto Rican. I'll accept that. Because that's still black family. But don't try to tell me he looked like Gorbachev. <laughs> or he looked like uh, Nixon or somebody. I ain't buying them cookies. You understand what I'm trying to say? No. No. Thank you, sir. And, and uh, Deuteronomy, my last question. In Deuteronomy 34, 10, uh, I was reading it, and I came across, um, it says, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And I was wondering if I was correct in my um, um, assumption that that corresponded with Deuteronomy 18, 18, where, um, in other words, if, uh, in Christianity, it's it thought that uh, the prophet like unto Moses would be Jesus. And if it says here in 3410 that there would not be another prophet from Israel like Moses, wouldn't that exclude Jesus? Did I, did I read that correctly? You did good. The thing is, well, if a man is a prophet like Jesus, but a stronger title is given to him, a title that even was carried over into the Quran, El Messiah. Yeah. You follow? So they refer to him as the anointed one. So though he was a prophet, he was also the anointed. So, they, so you follow what I'm saying? So they're saying, well, he was not a prophet to them. Even though, though he was. They, they identify with his title, the anointed one. That's what they're doing. So therefore he was not like Moses. He was Jesus right. was not like Moses. Muhammad was like Moses. I wrote a whole book about that. Right, I understand that. Oh, yes. So that does correspond with 1818. Yes, it does. You credit him. My pleasure. I was on... Um to one of these brothers right here, and they stated that if Jesus wasn't doing the will of the Heavenly Father, he must have had it, and he must have had his opinion, some sort of opinion. He was saying he wanted to know what opinion was. So basically, I, I, from my understanding, opinion is when two persons is, could be talking, and they have a philosophy. Of that it doesn't mean it's a fact. He said there has been some time where Jesus had his own opinion, and I said.
if the first one was Matthew and it was revealed in 41 A.D. in Palestine. You understand? That means Jesus the Messiah or Jesus Christ, however y'all Christians want to call him, never saw any of these books. Now here's the funny part about it. After you're dead, they wrote the books. They can write anything they want. And <laughs> they can make you match any prophecy they want if they wrote the book after you was already dead. Correct. You follow what I'm trying to say? If the men sat down after Jesus passed, no, he only had a small amount of followers at the time, so nobody could confirm the event or the incident or the time. It's not found in Judaic writings in Jerusalem. It's not found in the Roman manuscripts in Jerusalem or in Rome. None of the things that they talk about in these books are found any place else except in these books. You follow that? Yes. Yeah. So the point being that if you write a book about a man after he's dead, it's very easy to make it make the prophecy fit everything he did. Or it's easier to say he did these things. Mm -hmm. See, we couldn't do that in Al Islam because the incidents were happening to Muhammad as he lived. And every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him, he was there to confirm it and was in the presence of his Sahaba. Mm -hmm. They heard it themselves when they saw the incident that prompted the revelation that Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam, Muhammad received. But bear in mind when you look at the New Testament, the first book starts in 41 AD and the last one is in 98 AD. This is after Jesus, according to them, had already was on the cross, died and left. He's already gone. Then they wrote the book. So whenever you quote the Bible, bear in mind that whoever wrote it can write anything he wanted into it. Because the man who they wrote about was not there to proofread it. He was not there to verify it. He was not there to say, I didn't say that. That's why the Quran tells us that Jesus is going to tell them he never said half the things they said he said. He never made the statement that he was a lost upon what Allah ever. And that his mother and him should be taken as God. He never made those statements. And the Quran says he will come in the last day to tell those people he never made those statements. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So whenever you all do a New Testament thing, the first thing I like I'm to do is get in his heart that these books were written after Jesus had already left. And they can just about say anything they feel like and people are uh, subject to believe it. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah, they have no choice because who, how, can they, how can they check it? How, how could Jesus verify anything he did or said if everything he did and said was written after him. It's a, it's a very important point. I mean, it may not sound like that what I'm saying to you right now, but it's a very important point that people see that, because I don't think Christians can see that. No, I say, I say a lot of Christians don't even bear witness to when the book was revealed. They don't even get into that. They don't, they don't... Yes, they do, though. See, their scholars do. The thing is, they may avoid it when talking to you, uh -huh. but their scholars do know. And they know the section in John... Um, the book of John, verse, chapter 20, verse 9. Do you have a Bible? Yes. The scholars know this verse. And they know this verse quite well. But they never, ever stand up and read this verse in church. I've never heard it or heard about it. Jimmy Swagger can run all up and down the stage, but he never read this verse. Mm -hmm. Read this verse. For this as is John. Yet, sorry, go ahead. Okay, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then, See that? Go ahead. Then the disciples went away again into their own home. They're talking about the section 20 of the book of John is talking about the resurrection of the Son of God. I mean, that's how they put it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And from verse 1 on out, they start off talking about when Mary Magdalene went to the temple after the so-called crucifixion, of which the 19th chapter talks about the burial, him in the tomb and all that. And they go through a whole chapter there, and they get near to the end of this section, and they tell them, after Jesus was supposed to have been crucified and died on the cross, which was two days before this incident, by the time Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, after Jesus had been supposedly crucified and died, that those people who came, which was John and Mary Magdalene and another disciple, they did not even know that Jesus had to resurrect. They didn't know anything about a resurrection, and it tells them because it was no, they had no scripture of it. Read it again to yourself. Go back to 8 if you want. Then went also the other disciples, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. 
But as yet, they knew not the scripture that he must rise again. Where did they get this nonsense from? Yeah. Huh? Where did they get this nonsense that he rise from? It's right here in black and white. They made it up. Because Peter, Simon Peter, and John, and Mary Magdalene, when they got there, they didn't even know nothing about a resurrection. But he did teach, um... The resurrection of... If he was to, if, 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 he, if he was to be crucified, certain things would happen to him. That's right, because he himself thought he would be crucified. He did think he would be crucified, but then he found out, like it says, it literally says, then he found out all things that would happen to him. Mm -hmm. And that's when they so-called took him to the cross. And then he came out. If you go back to the 18th chapter, when they're speaking about the crucifixion, and go to the 4th verse, notice what they say. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, what? Went forth. Went forth. Now, I thought you Christians taught us that Jesus knew he was going to die on the cross from the day he was born. First of all, if you say he is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the flesh of Allah, if you say that he is, then you have to admit that he knows everything before it happens. Because that would be one of the attributes of being the creator of the universe, is to know everything that, before it happens, right? That's How true. could he be God and not know? True. All right, but they say in the Bible, God is all-knowing for them. So now, if he was God, then he not only knew, what does it say? No one knows the day nor the hour, but who? Allah. So therefore, he knows when every human being is going to die. Right? Correct. Now, let's don't use Allah because we confuse the Christians at this moment. Let's use what they want to hear. God. God knows every man's date of birth and date of death, according to your Christian doctrine. Here it says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things. Why? What happened? I'll tell you why. Go back to 18.1 and you see what happened. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook of Sidron, where was a garden. Into what? Into the which he entered and his disciples. That's right. Now he came across the garden and they went in. Then what happened? And Judas also, also, also which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oftentimes resorted Daniel. Daughter, that's right, to that place. Now, that means Judas, the, the betrayer of the Messiah, knew where Jesus and them would be. Because right. he knew that's where they went. So right. He wasn't with them. Okay. And then what happened? Judas then had received a band of man and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, coming there with lanterns and torches and weapons. That's right. Now notice, now Judas came. According to Christianity, what took place during this period of time? A very simple story they tell. Jesus went into the garden and fell on his face, and he prayed, and he wept, and his disciples fell asleep, right? And what was in Jesus' prayer? His prayer read, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What cup is he talking about? Crucifixion. The crucifixion. But not of my will, Father, but that thou will be done, he right. makes the statement. Is that not true? That's true. So now the Messiah, Jesus, is making a proclamation to them, to the, to the Heavenly Father, I do not want to be crucified, but I am willing to if that is your will. Correct. I don't want to, or as he said in another place, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. Mm -hmm. So now, notice, combine the incidents together, because they, they, they put that in Matthew, they put that in another book, but they didn't put that section in John. Right. That's part of the story. Because they would put that whole story together, you would have got a picture in your mind of what took place. Mm -hmm. You follow? So right. Jesus went to the garden and prayed, not to be crucified, because he said, if it be possible, if it be the will. Okay? Right. Then it follows the number four to say, what? Jesus therefore no one knows. Now he knew. You okay. see? Now he knew. Once he finished praying and asked his father that the cup would be passed from him, now verse four. Now he knew what was going to happen to okay. him. He's no longer scared. Aren't there verses in the Bible multiple places where it says that the Jews sought to kill Jesus and he ran. Yes, he they did. tried to put hands on him and he ran. He, right. tried, he, just, he snuck through the, through the crowd and ran. He did not want to die. Let me go back to his birth date. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the Christmas thing. And look at this. If Jesus was God, born God, he was born to die, right? Right. Christians said he was born to die on a cross. Right. Now, the Romans were not nailing babies on crosses. No. So Jesus, if that was his destiny, couldn't have died any place else but on a cross. Correct. If that was a divine creed from heaven that this man, which they used as a prophecy from the books of Daniel, 
and Isaiah and Jeremiah prophecies to confirm that he was to die on a cross for your sins, which Paul pulls out in the Corinthians according to the scripture, he says, yes? mm -hmm. So now if Jesus was destined to die on the cross, and his destiny was to die on that cross. So there was no reason whatsoever for Mary and Joseph, think now, think, think, think. There was no reason whatsoever for Mary and Joseph to have to leave Jerusalem to go to Egypt to protect the baby because Herod and them were not crucifying babies. That's right. Only grown men. You had to have a child to be crucified. They don't send little babies to electric chair. Mm -hmm. So there's no way Jesus could have died on a cross as a baby. And if his destiny was to die on a cross, then there was no way he could have died as a baby. So there was no reason whatsoever for them to leave Jerusalem and go to Egypt while Herod was ruling, because there's nothing Herod could have did to him. If destiny had it written that he was going to die on the cross, do you follow me? That's true. You see the trick they use? Truth is truth. Mm -hmm. See these little games? And then the sad part about it is, because Joseph and Mary took Jesus and migrated to Egypt, thousands of Israelite kids were killed. Do you mean to tell me that all of those kids died for nothing because if Jesus was destined to die on the cross and, and baby did not go to the cross, then there was really no reason for Joseph and Mary to migrate from Jerusalem to Egypt. Thus, there would have been no reason for Pharaoh. They could have gave, they could have, listen to this, they could have gave Jesus to Herod and he still couldn't have did nothing to him if it was destined for him to die on the cross. Correct. And then you made a statement earlier, I heard. You said it, you got a quote where it says that Jesus was willing to die for everybody. And that Christians use that to make it sound John like... John 6.51. Yeah, but what about John the Baptist? He did the exact same thing. He gave up his life as a willing sacrifice for his belief. Yes? Correct. And had himself beheaded, which is worse than crucifixion. Right. Why don't Christians acknowledge that John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus... Before Jesus was even teaching, John the Baptist had already built the congregation. Why don't they acknowledge the fact that John the Baptist was a willing sacrifice who gave up his life for his people and what he believed? How can they jump over John the Baptist and give all the credit to Jesus? Hmm? You understand what I'm saying? You got me. Of course, because they made these tricky stories up. Allah says in the Quran, all they have is conjecture. All they have is what they think in their mind. They don't have any facts about it. And when you get down to the facts, let's talk to facts again. We're back to St. John chapter 18, mm -hmm. and from 1 to 3, we speak about Jesus being in the garden. We know he fell on his face and he prayed, because that's right. in the book of Matthew. And right. he asked the cup passed from him. Right. And now we go to 4. Now Jesus knows everything that's going to happen to him. Mm -hmm. he got the confidence now. He's no longer running. He's no longer hiding. He's willing now, because he knows he's not going to die. So what does he walk out and say to them in number 4? And number four. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things. things that should come upon him, he knew what's going to happen to him, right. went forth and said unto them, Who seek ye? Who are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Right? Correct. Jesus said unto them, I, I am he. he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. That's who brought them there. Now don't forget, they had lanterns, torches and weapons when they came. That's right. verse 3. Right. They came ready. The only reason why they had lanterns is because there was no public light. Right. Don't get the illusion that you was in a park where there were lights. When the lanterns go out in Jerusalem, it is dark. There was no light system like we have in a park. Okay? Okay. Now it goes on to 6. As soon then, as he had said unto them, I am he, they went sick. They went backwards. backwards. And fell to the ground. And fell to the ground. Now, wait a minute. A whole army came to this place to get one man who they didn't believe had any power. Because if they believed he had power, there'd be no reason for them to come to get him. Right. But they came because they thought he was a phony, right? Right. And they came with weapons and lanterns. They came ready to do Jesus Christ some harm. Mm -hmm. And the moment he said, well, I'm the guy you came for, they just stepped backwards and fell down. Mm. Why? Christian preachers don't address that. They jump all over that. Why, tell us, why did they went backwards, I mean, turned around, literally, uh -huh. and fell to the ground? What did, what, did the, what did the soldiers and the Pharisees and the Jews, all these people with you who came to get Jesus, what are they doing laying on the ground? Disciples wasn't no problem because them guys were scared.
dead. They were sleeping. They wasn't a threat. You understand? Uh -huh. Why were they on the ground, asked the Christian? They don't even have an answer. They don't have no idea why. They'll make up something. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> They'll end up in another book, in a revised something. version, somewhere along the line when they revise the new, the new revised standard, updated chapter of the Bible will be in there. Since you hit it on the head. Okay. Let's go on just for, just for knowledge sake. Okay. Now we go to seven. Then act he again. Now, first of all, if they fell on the ground, the lanterns and stuff is out. Right. Now, they're getting back up, lighting lanterns, trying to get together. It wasn't like they reached in their pocket and, picked, and took out a big lighter and flickered a light, and that's how they got fired. <laughs> they didn't have matches back then. Uh -huh. People forget that. They had to take stones and hit them together or wood and make a fire. So a process of time is taking place now. They got to get this, these lanterns, because now they, obviously Jesus scared them. Something scared them because they knocked them to the floor. Now they got to get the lights back on, okay? Now let's assume that they're getting their lights back on. Right. Jesus asks them again. What does he say? What, the seven? Yes. Whom seek ye? Or who are you, who are you looking for? Whom seek ye? They right? said Jesus of Nazareth. That's right. And they said Jesus of Nazareth. Now these guys were scared. Mm -hmm. And Jesus answered, I told you. That I am he. That I am he. He had to reinforce that. I thought you told us, Christian. Well, that Judas was to portray Jesus with a kiss. And that the way they would know who Jesus is is because Judas would walk up and kiss him. Now, according to this, we are past that incident where Judas has supposedly walked up and kissed Jesus. That's past it now. That's past? It had to be past it because it's, it's after they came to get him. See, they don't have that in the book of John. They left that again in the book of Matthew. Oh, that's, that's why I got confused that because I remember studying one of your tapes. And you know the sad part about it? What? John was written in 96, Correct. And, and Matthew was written in 41. 41. That means John wrote his book how many years after? And yet he left out things that they put in. You see that? Mm -hmm. Now, wouldn't he have studied the manuscript of Matthew before he got his book? True. And if they say that John is the one that receives the revelations, and they say this is the same John who wrote the book of John, son of Zebedee, is the same one who receives the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. angels spoke to him. The heavens was opened unto him. He saw the 24 elders on the throne, the ancient of days, the four beasts. This man had insight into the spiritual world. Correct? Correct. According to them, if you read the book of Revelation, he had more insight than anybody in the whole book. Correct. Because nobody could explain the book of Revelation. Yet, now, let's go to that man, John, who has all the power that the Almighty used him as a witness for Jesus and a recorder for Jesus to give his word to the world, like it says in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. And now let's go to this chapter where he left out all of those little things that are in Matthew. Which one should we believe? Should we believe Matthew or should we believe John who received the book that had all this divine stuff in it? John. I'm sorry, go ahead. I should believe John. Why? Because what, what does Revelation chapter 1 say? The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass. Right. And he did what? And he sent it and signified it by his angel unto whom? Unto his John. servant John, the almighty of the galactic heavens and the planet Earth, sent an angel to John with the book of Revelation. Why? What does it say? Who bore record, who kept the record of the word of God. John is the one who kept the record for the Christians of the word of God. So now what book do we read out of the New Testament? Matthew, Mark, Luke, Paul, book of Corinthians, Hebrews, Galatians. What book do we read? Or we read this book and it tells you who... Who God selected and who he sent his angels to, and how he was responsible for keeping the record. Ain't that what it says? Right. Ain't that what we read? Yes. Is not this their Bible? Yes. Where is the problem? The problem is in money hungry preachers, okay. misguiding people. See, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism is now becoming political religion. They're losing their spirituality, and they're slowly but surely changing into political structure where they manufacture Qurans, they manufacture prayer beads, they manufacture Tazis, and they manufacture, you go to Mecca and you have to pay to get in, and everything is a ritual now, you got to go to the Saudi Arabia to get permission to get in Mecca, and you got to go to the, you know, you got to make a, a declaration that they believe in, you got to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, if you say, La ilaha illallah Kula Rasul Rasulullah, they say, no, you're not a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Now they say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, and they translate, there's no God but God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. And I say, why can't we say, La ilaha illallah, kula rasul, rasulullah. There is no God but God, and all of the messengers are his messengers. 
isn't that in accordance with what the Holy Quran says, the second chapter, the 136 verse? So we make no distinction, we just, but no, I got in there calling Why? Because some man, many years ago, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, fabricated a, a kalima and has established that that's the right way to do it, even though that does not comply with the Quran. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, does not comply with the Quran. La ilaha illallah, Kul Rasul, Rasulullah, complies with the Quran. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, so when you come out and point that out, you are a deviator. You are an innovator. You are a troublemaker. Because you are pointing out the truth of the Quran. See, the Arabs have a very strange way of doing things. What they do is they make the statement, if you can prove the Quran wrong or produce anything like it, then come forth and do it. But they, then they follow by saying, and you can't, so don't. Ain't that one of the Quran, ain't that one of the standard statements they say? They right. use the word Al-Burhan. Come forth and show it. All right? Now, in history, a man named Musallima, right? Mm -hmm. Ibn Habib al Hanif came forth with his own version of the Quran. And it's, right, it's, right, it's right in the Hadith. They call him the liar. I don't know if you ever read it. He no. came with his own version of the Quran and his own idea for a doctrine. And Abu Bakr Sadiq had him killed. Is that what Allah said to him? Did Allah say, let, let him bring forth his doctrine because two will laugh and fall things will perish? Correct. Or did he say, when someone tries to challenge you, kill them? They made that up. It's not in the Quran anywhere. Now, another man, like I mentioned last week, Dr. Rashad Khalifa from Egypt, who perfected in number 19, living in Tucson, Arizona, he came forth with his own translation of the Quran. His translation. Right or wrong, I'm not a lot, I don't make no difference. But it's his translation. And his understanding of Al-Islam, his understanding. Now, what does Allah tell me and you to do about things like that? Does Allah tell us to go kill him anywhere in the Quran? No. Allah has faith that, the, that his words will stand against anything. And any real Muslim has faith that the words of Allah will stand against anything, and anybody, and any doctrine. Only a fool will go out and kill the man because he's taken Allah's laws into his own hands. And of course, they say Farrakhan should be killed. Imam Isa should be killed. They've already killed Clarence Thurkinet. They've already killed Malcolm X. They've killed Dr. Mishak. That's what they do. Why? Because those Orthodox Sunni Muslims do not. not, 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 not again, I'm not talking about all the Orthodox Sunni Muslims all over the whole world. I'm not talking about the ones who really try to follow the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad. I'm talking about those ones who are fabricating Hadith out of Saudi Arabia, drinking and smoking and chasing women with their money. And then trying to set up organizations branching out of Memphis, Tennessee, and launching this pro extensive multi-billion dollar program to brainwash people into worshiping them and their image. That's the statement I've been making to the Sunni. I, we, do, we don't want to fight you, but you don't really want to fight us either, because you don't know how many of us there really are. Right. You think all of us are the guys you see on the feet in the white. You need to come to our military meeting and find out how many of us there really are. That's right. They don't really want to start this fight. They just think they want to start this fight. I prefer them to sit down and talk. But I know they don't want to talk to me. You know they don't want to talk to me. And even if they stand up in their quick and say, I'll debate with Imam Isa, you know they'd rather walk in a lion's cage with a pork chop suit on <laughs> than to stand in a room <laughs> and then to stand in a room and debate with me in Arabic, Hebrew, or English. You know they don't want to do it, and they know they don't want to do it. So they're making a fool out of themselves by telling their congregation, I'll debate him any time. Uh. Well, you know, so oh, well, I got three questions of a book that has over 360 questions that you cannot answer. And there's nothing you can ask me I can't answer. Nothing a Sunni Muslim can come up with that I can't give him an answer to. I can, but there's nothing that I can ask him can he answer. That's truth is truth. And time will reveal itself. So the best thing they could do is realize who the enemy really is, and we better unite. Let me, let me repeat a very important thing. Mm -hmm. I do not have to be the imam. Now that's what they think my problem is. I do not have to be the imam. You understand? Mm -hmm. Let all of us agree to shut up and sit down and bring the right imam forward to see. You understand? Right. But that imam has to be able to answer the question we ask. That's all. He has to know the Quran. He has to understand the Hadith. Know the good one from the bad one. Not the ones that Saudi Arabian society is good and bad. Mm -hmm. But what matches the Quran? He has to know the Torah because the Quran says so. 
He has to know El Ingeal because the Quran says so. You follow? Yeah. Let him come forth and he can lead us all. And I will shut up. <laughs> I'd love to pack up and go to Sudan and just live in the village and that's it. Forget about this headache in America. <laughs> but they can't. They don't have it. So everybody's striving to be leaders. Everybody wants to rule people. Everybody wants a congregation. Everybody wants somebody to pat them on the back. Even if they don't qualify. Come on. Look outside at the Ansar Allah community. You understand? Right. Look at what you see. And every time you're coming to this neighborhood, we got something new to offer you. Is that a fact? True. We're trying to bring out everything we can think of to raise the consciousness of our people. Is that a fact or not? That's true. That's true. The money you give our brothers is why you're in this room. The money you've been giving on the train out your pocket, saying here for the school, here for the community, you can walk in this room and look around, you see this didn't cost no pennies to build. You can go on the market and see there ain't no market like that in America. That's where your money went. Now go to Bedford Avenue and ask them to show you where the money is that they've been donating. And they've existed here before us. We came in 1970. They've been propagating Sunni Islam here way before 1914. Then they turn around and look at a man like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and say he's not rightly guided. <laughs> what a joke. <laughs> I looked at the lecture that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave just the other day. His last Savior's Day. Can you all see that thing? No, I would like to. It's long. That's the point. Honorable Elijah Muhammad stood there and taught for about five straight hours on his feet. Let me go back. Because I have been in that classroom and you all have seen me. And I'm, and I'm only 44. And I've been walking back and forth. By the time I finish talking, I'm exhausted. Right. My legs are tired. You understand? But the honor Elijah Muhammad, y'all better look at these things. Don't be blinded by no stupid Arab propaganda. You better look at this and look at it close. Stood on his feet for five straight hours talking at Savior's Day in the presence of thousands of his followers. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. This is a human being now. I want y'all to tell me. I really want y'all to tell me who was holding him up. Because I know he wasn't standing on his own feet for no five hours, three minutes at the top of his voice. Because at 40 years old, I'm exhausted when I finish. Stop letting people misguide you by stupidity. Allah shows you his miracle. Now, if you don't want to believe that Master Prophet Muhammad was somebody special, that is your prerogative. Now, if you want to read a whole bunch of ideas and pick out a bunch of white people and say all of them are special to you, that's your prerogative, home. <laughs> that is definitely your prerogative. But you're not feeding that stuff to me. Because, can you fool a Muslim? Not nowadays. Tell me again. Not nowadays. We're coming to tell you, Sunni. We are not going to be fooled by the devil. We know we are teachers. We know we're the poor righteous teachers. We know who the true and living Allah, the Creator, is. We're not going to be deaf, dumb, and blind. We know it's time for the history of Islam to renew itself. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught his followers. He said, the day when you see leaflets falling out the sky, pick them up and follow that. Did he not? Right. Well, I'm throwing leaflets out. The leaflets are coming down out the sky to y'all. He told you to look for it. Is anybody else throwing out leaflets? Nope. No. Is anybody else coming down from the sky? No. Nope. He also said the man would come from the east and raise up in the west. Ain't that what he said? That's right. Well, I was born in the east, but I was raised in the west. It didn't say he would be born and raised in the east and come here. Because mm -hmm. then that wouldn't work. Because it doesn't work for the Sunnis. Because <laughs> all their teachers come from the east over here and they still don't have nothing but a soft front mom. They don't have nothing to offer their kids. No Arabic, no doctrine, no teaching, and no salvation. That I can foresee, except in dreams, Martin Luther King was the best dream I knew. And his dream didn't work. Because black people can't live on dreams. We got to wake up and deal with the reality of what's going on around us. We've got to build a Nubian nation. We've got to instill freedom, justice, and equality. We've got to have our own, like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said. We've got to build this nation. Because we don't have anything else to fall back on. we got to, <laughs> let me tell you, people, we've got to have a reason to die. We're walking around without a reason to die. Niggas be getting hit by cars and shot down for selling drugs. That ain't even a reason to die. We've got to have something that's worth dying for. How can you be a martyr if you don't have nothing to be martyred for? 
we got to have something we build for our women and our children that we have a reason to defend it. We won't be men until we do. Because the scripture says that man is supposed to work by the sweat of his brow. That is our job as men, to work by the sweat of our brow, to provide for our women and our children. Our women and our children are not supposed to be out there working. Your wife ain't supposed to be working in no factory or working in no office with no white man or working downtown. That's not where she belongs. She belongs home. Her home baking cake and not buying cake. <laughs> <laughs> she belongs home. She's supposed to know about herbology. She's supposed to know when the baby gets ill in this, in this ill, disease-infested country, she's supposed to know what type of herbs to get from the earth to put together to cure that baby. You understand? She's supposed to cook your food fresh, not open no can by Del Monte. <laughs> Or run to the freezer and pop out some frozen, dehydrated food that's been frozen almost 10 years ago and stick it in microwave and nuke it? Or run off to raise and buy a pizza? <laughs> and call that a night? Nah, nah, black woman. That ain't what you were created here for. <laughs> nah, nah. You are the mother of civilization. You're the greatest thing that ever happened, Eve. You know why? Because Adam thought he was complete until he looked around and saw you wasn't there. Right. And he turned to the Heavenly Father in distress. And he said, I'm going to create for you a help me. I'm going to create a from you. The best part of you came out of us and went into her. A help me. And she shall be called Hawa. Or Haya, because she is the mother of all living. How can she perform her duties, brother? if we don't provide the environment necessary. How can we expect her to act the part of a woman, brother, but we're not acting the part of a man? We telling her, become a Muslim, put on a veil, serve Allah, and we sneaking around still partying, smoking cigarettes, chasing other women, doing all the things we tell her to stop doing, we still doing. Am I right? Now it's time for us to wake up and build our nation. Hate me don't mean nothing. I'm nobody. I've already put out over 300 books. So hate me ain't going to stop the mission. Why? Because you people in that room got the word now, and you're going to spread the gospel whether I'm here or not. Am I right? Right. You're going to take it to the world and got to deal with it anyway. But I'm going to I'm tell you, I'm going to turn us into men. Because the white man did everything he can to turn us into women. Have us working for him, smiling in his face, dressing the way he say, drinking the poison he feeds us, the, uh, uh, drinking the por poison and the, the liquor and the wine and the beer and all, and then eating the pork and the ribs. And the <laughs> man, he was doing everything in his power to cloud our minds. You know the miracle involved, I think I said this ten years ago. One of the miracles I, I, I acknowledge in the country was beautiful. Get all the pork y'all ate, Allah gave y'all the watermelon. I know you may not understand what I mean by that. I don't, let me make it clear. See, the white man was making fun of black people while they were eating watermelon. And they show a brother with nip, and he's slapping in the watermelon, they're laughing, not knowing that a watermelon is a fruit that flushes the system. You understand that? So while the devil was feeding you talk, they planned a plan, and a law plans a plan. And what? Tell me the next, y'all. Oh, the best plan. <laughs> Can they deal with that? Nope. We got to get back to manhood if we're going to expect our women to act like women. You can't have them out there working for the devil. Because they've got their rules and regulations that they live by. And they abide by them regardless of what they're told to do. They will follow Yaku's rules and regulations regardless of what. They don't care about you. White man or that white woman who works next to you, smiles and gives you a gift on Christmas, will portray you at the top of a hat for Yaku to enforce their law. That same one who smiles in your face and wants to go to lunch with you every day will portray you. Look what they did to World of Muhammad recently. Now they got a newspaper out, a Sunni Muslim newspaper called the Midlist, where they're saying that he has to denounce his father, otherwise he's not a Muslim. That's what they're saying. 
I got the article, and I will print it, because you know me. <laughs> They're saying he has to denounce his father, because his father was not a Muslim. I'm talking about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And they're the ones who decide he was not a Muslim, of course. Because, I mean, do we see that? Do we see Honorable Elijah Muhammad as not a Muslim? No. <laughs> I don't know where they got that sickness from. You mean, see, he's not an Orthodox Sunni Muslim? As far as we're concerned, they're not Muslim. You understand what I'm saying? But they're saying that he has to deny him because he made himself out as a messenger and he worshipped for Rod Muhammad, which made him a pagan. And they forget that the Prophet Muhammad of 1400 years ago, his father, name was Abdullah, servant of Abdullah, and if the Prophet Muhammad was the one that first received the revelations of Tawheed, the oneness of Allah in Mecca, then his father was also a pagan. The Prophet Muhammad's father was a pagan, but he doesn't deny him. Don't see what happens. And I'm not saying he should have. I'm saying that men of modern times are introducing new ideas into things that did not exist in the time of the Prophet. And they're trying to feed that to me and you as law. They ain't trying to feed it to us as an idea or an opinion. They're telling us this is how it must be. And if you don't comply with this, we will kill you. Stop letting yourself be tricked by them. I'm telling them devil from Saudi Arabia. It's a plot. They are the descendants of Muslim themselves. They're from Jahtan. They're from a, a place called Yamama in Saudi Arabia, which is presently called Riyadh. That's where that phony sect came out. And the Wahhabi sect are the people who encourage the teachings of that false man called Muslim. That's who they follow. That is their Muhammad. They're not trying to follow the real Muhammad. They have their own Muhammad. The same way the Christians made their own Jesus. And they got them writing hadith about this man. I mean, I read hadith. And, and I mean, I got relatives from Sudan that look at me like, you know, you're supposed to recognize this hadith. And I say, I'm going to recognize a hadith to discuss this. Aisha, speaking about how much semen was on the Prophet Muhammad's robe. What? Oh, man, read the hadith. I, I don't, they, they tell you all a lie and tell you all I say don't read the hadith. I never said that. I say read the hadith. That's the only way you're going to see how much of it is fabricated by man. They try to make the Prophet Muhammad look bad in the hadith. But they pretend they try to make, you know when you say the Prophet Muhammad looked up and he, and he stopped the moon in its motion and he split the moon in two parts. Now we know that if the moon has split it in two parts, in anywhere in history, you understand? And I'm not talking about breaking off the moon into the earth like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught. I'm not talking about that. They say he looked up, and for a miracle, he made the moon split in the, in the front of people. Now, we know that the astronomers and the soothsayers and all the magis and, and all them worshippers of the stars would have had that on record somewhere. Yes? Right. They know that they're making statements that cannot be backed up by fact, and they're trying to make the Prophet Muhammad look bad by doing that. See, when you're listening to it, it makes him sound great. If you, if you don't catch the subliminal trick, while well, our prophet has the power to split the moon. But then if you get in a debate with somebody who's an astronomer who has a history of astronomy for the last hundred years, or 1,400 years, but they was into astrology and the zodiac, we have a whole chapter in the Quran devoted to the zodiac. Baruch, talking about it. So they existed back then. So they knew about astronomy and the stars. And they won't have no record ever of the moon parting into two parts. So in the long run, what you're taking to look good about the prophet ends up making him look bad. They know what they're doing, and we ain't buying it. If you have any further questions, call now. Area code 718-452-9329. 718-452-9329. If you would like a taped copy of today's broadcast, contact the original tent of Kedar by calling area code 718-452-9329.